to welcome to another class uh, about the brown spaces. And today's class, we will continue to talk about paleovenous spaces. And uh, so let me just recall what we did in the last class. In the last class, we, in the final part, we uh, talked about uh, the Shannon uh, Whitaker interpolation formula, which has several applications, as I mentioned, um, and as basically uh, any kind of uh, analysis of a signal. So, in a signal, you can understand it in a broad sense. It could be a picture, it could be a voice, uh, it could be a message some kind of uh, bank information, etc. Uh, um, as long as it's a continuous thing, you know, uh, then you can use this thing. And the, the, using this thing is useful. So as I mentioned, whenever you have some kind of a, a, a signal over time, then uh, um, usually the signal is not, uh, represents a function, uh, of a real variable time, but it's not usually uh, band limited. So what you can do is you can approximate that function by uh, an interpolation formula like this, by just sampling the function at certain points. So suppose you have, let's say a signal like this, you have some kind of function here and this, let's say this is a, a X, so we use the same notation. So X would, could be time, the time variable. And here is your function F. And what you can simply do is along the time, you could just sample your function at certain points. So these would be F of N over two B. And B, uh, one over B would be the fre frequency of the sampling. So one over B is like the, the frequency of the sampling. So okay. And then by this formula, if B is very large, if you write this formula here like this, what basically you're doing, it's exactly you're doing, is you, you write so this thing here would be equal to the projection of your function f. So I'm assuming that f is, has, doesn't have a, a, a compactly supported for hidden form. It's just a, a random uh, signal. But uh, well, what you're doing here is this projection by writing that formula is just projecting your function in the Paley-Wiener space of type uh, uh, two pi b. Okay, let's say L two. Uh, I didn't define uh, the other LP, but anyway, it's just projection. So, so by writing uh, this, because uh, well, these functions. Well, as you saw, these functions here are the Fourier transform of the uh, the explanations in the counterpart. So, the 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 Fourier transform of f can be expanded as a Fourier series in the orthonormal. There will be an orthogonal basis, and if you just compute the Fourier transform of that, then you get an orthogonal basis in the Paley-Wiener space as well, because they are, they 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 are asymmetric. Uh, the L two from minus B B and the Paley-Wiener space as we saw before. So these guys here are orthogonal, okay? So they, they form an orthogonal basis for the payload in the space. So when, whenever you're doing something like this, basically you're just writing the projection. So this thing here, that's what I wanted to say, but I didn't say it in the last class. This thing would be just, so maybe I should use another letter. Suppose you have a signal, let's say uh, S, S is a nice, so that would be just a projection of, projection of the signal in the, into the uh, Paley-Wiener space of type two pi b. Okay. So 
So what you're doing with your signal is you compute its full Hilton form, truncating from minus B to B and computing the full inverse. That would be your, your projection. So that's why it's useful because uh, it's a very simple to sample signals in real life. <laughs> and if you sample with a very, maybe the frequency, the very high frequency, maybe this shouldn't be the frequency, maybe it should be B the frequency. Yeah, one over B is the frequency. I don't know. Uh, if you sample with a very small uh, separation here, it was a very high frequency, let's say, of sampling. Um, then you can recover this, the, the, your original function very uh, accurately, okay? Because this, as, since this is approximation, this will converge back in L2 to S. Okay, so as long as B is sufficient for large, that's a very good approximation. You can do it very fast because basically just have to sample your function. And, um, and this also, there is some uh, classical results about uh, um, what happens when you sample, but you make some mistakes, there is some error associated, what kind of error you can put in this thing so to guarantee so a good approximation, et cetera. So this is the classical uh, signal processing stuff. So this is what I didn't say uh, last class, what else? Any questions here? Comments? Um, and another thing that I didn't, that I realized later is that in the proof of the Paley-Wiener theorem, so let me go back to the statement. So theorem F was Paley-Wiener theorem, that is if you have a function L2 is some B, then uh, F had a support in minus BP, is equivalent to say that it extends as an entire function and it's Fourier to form is, uh, I'm sorry, and, it's, and it has exponential type at most uh, two pi b. Okay, that was the paley venus uh, theorem. And in the end, I rush and I actually have, have to do some, some extra step to finish. So nobody complained, which is okay, but uh, somebody should realize that, uh, yeah, so we proved that a certain function actually is analytic outside this disk. And then I just said that because of that, we had this identity and this has to be zero. Okay, this is not actually true because this bit here is not actually true. I can't, as in the way I showed, I can't say that, um, sorry, this bit equals that bit, okay? I simply can't say that because I don't know if F has the representation I need to say that this is equal to that, okay? So I want to address that now, I want to fix. I want to, so I will uh, remember what, what the proof was about and then fix this last step. Maybe you still don't realize what was the problem, but uh, I, I will I will explain now in detail. So let me just erase this thing. So let me prove this. So proof of theorem F. Okay. So what we did there. So. What we did was we defined a certain function f beta of z by this formula here. So that was uh, the part that, that, that two implies one. That means if the function has exponential type uh, and it's L2 on the line, then its Fourier transform is compactly supported. So I defined this guy here. Uh, and then we showed that, so, and then we showed that this is analytic in the half plane H theta, where the drawing is, you have a circle, you have a direction, this is B, this is the direction, 
So I named it theta, and then we have a half plane here, an open half plane. This guy here was h theta. Okay, so that's the drawing. And then we later showed, uh, then later we showed. There actually there is this analytic function from outside the disk of so oops. from outside the disk so greater than b to c analytic and uh, f equals f theta in h theta. So that means that all these functions f theta, which were just um, uh, a way of uh, an integral representation in this half plane of a, a common function, capital F. That's the way to, to, to think about it. OK, so. And then we realized that, what else? And then we realized that if I do F zero of I Y minus F pi of I Y, that was uh, exactly the integral from minus infinity to infinity of F hat of X e to minus two pi uh, I Y dx, okay? But we have a problem in making this computation and, and I didn't explain that well uh, in the final part of the result because um, because, well, f zero because because F zero is defined only here and F pi is defined in only here, okay? And I want to evaluate at a point I, Y. Well, I want to test if the Fourier, oh, this is, uh, this is like this. So this was uh, F hat of, of I, uh, of Y, which is uh, F hat of Y. And I want to evaluate for y, uh, moduli of y greater than, than b. So I, I show that f hat at this point is zero. Um, but then I want to evaluate at some point here outside this disk of radii b. But I can't because this f theta and f pi, they're not, uh, you can't evaluate it there, okay? And what I didn't use, and nobody realized, I didn't use the fact that f was L1. So I have to use at some point. Remember that I showed that these integrals were well defined only using the fact that my uh, function f here was of exponential type because I was just always bounded by the exponent by the exponential and then uh, uh, and then uh, playing with this thing here so I have a, a convergent uh, uh, absolutely convergent integral okay, so I have to use at some point and that's where we used where we have to use it now uh, uh, you can show that if for instance if X is positive, uh, then F zero is actually analytic uh, if X is possible, but we have to show that actually F zero is analytic for X positive. 
So I can actually extend, so F would define here, I can actually go up to all this thing here and, and continues. for x greater or equal than zero, okay? And analogously, f pi would be uh, continuous for x less than zero and uh, analytic and continuous up to less, x less or equal than zero. So they actually will be able to meet, these two functions would beat at this point. And if I show this, then since I know that uh, they all represent the same function outside the disk, the limit going in this direction will have to be equal to the limit going in this direction, okay? And, and that's how we finish. So let me show this. So how can we show that? Well, basically to show that F0 is analytic in this range, I just have to bound the integral uh, absolutely. So uh, if we go to the definition, well, f is, would be just a simple integral uh, uh, times an exponential. So this would be just like zero to infinity, f of whole, and then e to minus two pi. And in here, which you put what, just four, because I'm just integrating in the positive axis. And this is just uh, some, uh, uh, I'll have to take the real part of this. So this would be just X. Not oh, default, sorry. Okay. Well, but F is L1, okay. Uh, in particular, bounded. So this will converge. So this would be finite. Okay. And moreover, when whole goes to, uh, when X goes to zero, when x goes to zero, then this will converge to the L1 or, or to the integral of f on the right-hand side on the re positive axis, which is finite because f is L1. So that shows the continuous part as well, okay? And by the same reason, by the same reason, computation, f pi is analytic. for x less than zero and continues. X less so you could than zero. Okay. Um, excuse me? Yes. Uh, could you repeat why it's continuous? I see the analytic part, but. Yeah, so we're just bounding the, the integral absolutely. And when I send x to zero positively from, from the right-hand side, this converges to zero, okay? And my assumption was that F, uh, so recall that the, so the assumption was that F is L2 on the line, but step one was, I can assume that F is L1. Mm -hmm. So that, that, and the, the mm -hmm. trick was uh, just to multiply by a sink. Let me go back. Yeah, step one, we can assume that the function is L1 and the trick was just to multiply by a sink. Okay, so now I can assume that F is L1 and if I assume that F is L1, I actually get continuity. It's even better. I see. Okay. Okay. And then now we can evaluate uh, what we want because then we can say that then uh, uh, F0 of IY minus F pi of IY is well defined. And it is the limit when X goes to zero, let's say positively, of f x plus i y f zero minus f pi of minus x plus i y, okay? But if y is, let's say, bigger than b, if, if I'm this point here, then I'm coming from this side and going from this side, but in here and in here, I know that both f pi and f zero, they coincide with this very same function f. So then I can replace this by, F. Okay, 
and this has to be zero. Okay, because this is just a limit. This this is just f of i y minus f of y y. Okay, so that was the the, the gap that in the, in the proof. I mean, in the third wing, I was right. I was right. That's just what you have to do. But uh, it's not it, you, you. You do have to make this extension here, and then uh, which I forgot to 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 explain. Any questions now? I think it's, it's clear now. And please, whenever, whenever you explain something that looks, uh, I don't get it, don't be afraid, just ask me. Sometimes I say uh, things that I don't really mean or I forgot some very important detail. Okay. Um, so, so now what I want to do is to give um, another characterization of the payload in a space. So, so far we have two characterizations, which is uh, either F hat, the support is contained in an interval, or the type of F is less or equal than 2 pi B. Okay, so that, that these are the two characterizations of the payload in the space. Um, I want to write another one that um, um, that would well, you could define another way, but anyway, you, you that will uh, allowed me to define the payload in a space for other LPs. Okay, so I can have a payload in a space where I think it's LP on the line instead of just L2, okay. So the, and that will be theorems, theorem G, okay. Uh, you can show if just, uh, maybe that's a comment for later. Let me just uh, write this result. So let F be entire uh, and some P between one and infinity, then the following are equivalent. Okay. First, F belongs to LP on the real line, and the type of F, which just to recall you, when you take the linear soup, the moduli, the log of the moduli, it says less or equal than two pi b, to some b positive two, f over minus two pi pi b c, and f divided by f star divided by minus two pi pi b c. And again, F star is when you make the double bar. You bar the variable and then you bar the function. So you get another entire function. This guy belongs to the Hardy space. These two guys belong to the Hardy space. Okay. Okay. And well, if that is true, then great. I can define the payload in a space as an entire function, LP on the line, so that the type is less or equal than two pi B, exactly like the, the payload in a space, but with the L2, now with LP. And this would be equal to this space here. And that would be, you can easily show that this is a closed subspace of the Hardy space, okay? So therefore it's a Banach space, so it's complete, okay? Um, so by this uh, result, you can easily define the payload unit. So let me, so by this result, uh, we can define, see, payload unit space P 
of 2 pi b. So my original definition was just pw, that was for L2. So now from now on, we have to put a 2, pwg. And for the other p's, we just put a p. So that would be what? F entire, F on the real line LP, type of F, let's say you put them 2 pi b. And that would be equivalent to this uh, uh, other thing, would be equal to F entire, F divided by B minus 2 pi pi b c, and F divided by F star divided by And you can easily show that this is a Banach space by using uh, the characterization too. Meaning, you just have to show that it's, that it's close to the close subspace of this guy. Okay, so let's prove this. And um, <clears throat> another remark is one important bit of this characterization is that when we go to define the brown spaces, which maybe we will do in the next class, or if not, definitely in the next week, um, we can use the second characterization here to define the LP version of this the brown spaces. So in the Bruns book, it, it, he only shows the L2 version, but you can also define the LP version, and this characterization here, the way we define it, the, the pre-Levina space. In this way, it would be easily, you would be able to easily extend to define the, 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 the brown space. So, uh, so that's why this characterization show is good. So let me prove the easy one. The easy one I think is two implies one. Let's see. Yeah, so, so if a function belongs to the HP space, what do we know? Uh, so let me assume first uh, that uh, P is finite, okay? Um, if, if P is finite, then we know that we have Cauchy's representation for this function. Let's, let's say I work with this function here first. Okay, so we have Cauchy's representation for this function, which is F C divided by minus two pi i p c equals one over two pi i integral of f t divided by minus two pi i p t t minus z d t for minus infinity to the power. And not only that, if if we have even more, so maybe I should say like this: F C divided by minus two pi C, if Z is in the upper half plane, and zero if Z is in the lower half plane. So I should say like this. So that's, that's uh, what we showed when we were studying Hardy spaces. So one thing I can do, I can just move this, this, this bit here to the left. So let me put it here. Yes, and then I move this thing. Okay. Um, and then we can have the same representation for well, but the assumption F star divided by the thing, okay? So if you do that representation, we get what? We will get that uh, E to minus two pi I B Z divided by two pi I minus infinity to infinity. And now is it with F star, so I should have a bar here. This was the same, so it's just that T minus Z, the T that should be F star, which is F Z Z, Z Z bar, uh, Z bar, that's in the upper half plane, and zero in the lower half. Okay. 
But then in here, what I will do is I will change Z by Z bar and then conjugate the whole formula. So, so let's first change Z by Z bar. So I put bar here, the bar there. Move this thing here. Now Z bar belongs there and Z bar belongs there, which is the same as saying that this is minus and this is plus. Great, and now I conjugate the whole formula. So then this vanishes, this vanishes, this becomes a plus. This, oops. This becomes Z. There is a minus because of this I here below and this goes back to Z, but this becomes a plus. Okay. Great, so what do we have now? This. And now we can add the formulas because this bit here gives F in the upper half plane, but gives zero in the lower half. So if I add these two formulas, for instance, in the upper half plane, I want to get F because the formula below on the upper half plane gives zero. Okay, so if I add these two formulas, And you will see that we will do a similar procedure in a, when we define with the burn space later. If I just add the formulas, I get a formula for F for a point which is not uh, real. Uh, and I, I can write what the formula is. Just put everything together, you will get Ft minus infinity to infinity. And in here we get minus two pi pi B uh, Z divided by minus two pi pi B T minus E to two pi pi B Z divided by two pi pi B T divided by two pi I T minus Z D T. So I just add the formulas and put everything inside the integral so it looks nice. Okay. And now this term you can simplify and you will see that this is our reproducing kernel. This is exactly equal to this. This is, this is something minus its imaginary parts and we just work it out what it is. It's, sorry, something, uh, some, something minus its conjugate, then it will be just uh, the, the imaginary part of twice 2i, the imaginary part, so this 2i cancel, and you get that. Okay, uh, great. DT. So, uh, so nice. So if, if that condition is satisfied, it means that your function is defined like this. Even more, uh, so this is working if, if I didn't assume, suppose I didn't assume that F was entire at all. I just assume that F is analytic in the upper and lower half plane, okay? And on the real line is, I don't just continuous, I don't know, or some, has some kind of limit. But when I do this thing, uh, it belongs to the HP space. This representation will still hold true, okay? But now I can even put Z on the real line because this is still a convergent kernel and this is an LP and this is definitely an LP prime if P is not infinity. So P prime will be greater than one. So this actually works for every Z in the complex plane. Oops. Okay. So we get a nice representation, which was what, what we have for the payload in a space. So we still, we get a, a, a reproducing kernel representation here. The, the only difference that the, the reproducing kernel is now not in uh, L2, so F is LP and the reproducing kernel should be LP prime, et cetera. But anyway, you get a, some nice representation. And then from this, we can deduce that F is of exponential type, which is what we wanted to show. We just uh, simply apply some holders inequality. So we get here norm P 
And then in here you get the norm P prime of this, of this thing. P prime in T, of course, which is the same as I'm mean, removing the real part of this, just putting IY here. IY in there. Um, and then you can uh, we'll leave as an exercise. It's easy to show that uh, this, whenever you do an LP norm of these guys, it's always less or equal than some kind of constant. Let's say CP prime and E to the three pi uh, B. So it's always the type times Y. Okay, and, and suppose I'm doing this, yeah, time, times model I of Y. But it, so this part here is a, an exercise to compute this LP norm and to show that. Um, so what we're doing here is to take the sync function and doing uh, the LP norm in a certain line. Okay. And then uh, we have to show that basically this behaves like this. And, and, it's, uh, and it, it's easy to see because, well, you just write it this as a difference of exponentials and, and then you can pull out this thing and then you have a norm of LP prime norm of one over something. P prime would be greater, let me write the P prime here. Let's say one over P plus one over P prime equals one. And so since I'm assuming that P is less than infinity, P prime would be greater than one. Okay, so, so these things. And this constant CP prime will blow up if P prime converges to one. Okay, so that's why we have to eliminate that, the case. But anyway, this shows that F, this implies that type of F is less so you put on two point B. So let me prove the other one now, the other one. Oh, that, oh, you have to deal with the case uh, P equals infinity. Let me deal with the case P equals infinity first. Now, what happens if P equals infinity? I can't do this sort of argument, uh, but what I can do is the following trick. I just define G to be this guy, okay? So F was bounded, okay? Because uh, bounded on a real line. Uh, sorry, the condition is uh, that this belongs to H infinity, which means it's just this quotient, this quotient uh, is bounded in the upper half plane. Okay. So then it's easy to see that the same is true for this G. Just making things better, actually. But moreover, uh, since f is bounded in the f divided by this exponential, or f star divided by this exponential is bounded in um, the upper half plane, and you're dividing by z, you can actually take, let's say, the L2 norm for instance, because now you have a decay and you can take the L2 norm. Then you can show that this actually belongs to uh, H2, okay? You use the fact that F is bound and you use this extra decay with the Z and there you have it. But then, well, by the calculation we just did, then GZ, for instance, in model I with the last way put in some constant, say um, true, times e to two pi by by what you just did, okay? But that easily implies that f has the same thing because uh, g, uh, uh, because, uh, because okay, so, so this would imply that what, that f of z is less so you couldn't, let's say, model of f of zero plus C2 model I of Z, E2 by B model I of Z. 
Yes, you're just applying the triangle inequality, for instance. So then F is of exponential type. So it's hard for graph. Also, we could achieve that. Okay. So now let me show that one implies two. That is, if F is LP on the line and the type is two pi B, then this thing belongs to HP. Okay. Any questions in the previous case? Can you maybe explain once again why, how we could conclude that F is an LP? Um, so the assumption is that F is, oh, here you're saying this, this conclusion here. I mean above. So F is in the Hardy space. So it's only bounded for stripes, right? Yeah. And how could we conclude that it's in general LP? Yeah, so in concluding is in L2, um, in H2. But uh, uh, what I mean is, well, the assumption is that F divided by, let's say it's just with F, for instance. This is bounded, okay? H infinity of C plus is just bounded in the half plane. So for instance, uh, let me use green. So for instance, let's, let's check this guy here. So G, Z divided by minus two pi I, B, C is F for what? z divided by minus 2 pi i dz minus an f of 0 minus 2 pi i dz divided by z. Okay, this thing is bounded in the upper half plane. Okay, and this thing here is also bounded in the upper half plane because e2 pi i dz in model i is just minus two pi b y, and the y is positive. Okay, so, so the upper part in this fraction is bounded. So this is less equal than a constant divided by moduli of z. Okay, so if I integrate in the upper half plane, let's say now to in a line here, that's, a, that's still okay because when I integrate in this line, this thing is what? This thing is uh, x squared plus uh, y squared is equal to x. And then we'll take the square of this thing and integrate in x from x from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, I, get, uh, I get the number, which is just, uh, you couldn't even do a change of variables in this integration. You would get something like multiplied by y, you get something like one over y. So this, so the integration would be something like one over y. Okay, and then in lining. So when I get closer to the real line, I could, can maybe have a problem. So what you do is you just uh, take a cap here. And then when you, when you integrate it in something close, you just integrate from, from, let's say this is minus one, one, and this is one, for instance. So you just integrate this function here, which would be like a computing norm I will choose, so I have to integrate this let's say from minus infinity to one. And that's still okay because that is less than what? That, that would be, well, that would be equal to integrating from let's say one to infinity. And uh, then I can just bound by this, okay, which is uh, one. Oh, for, it's finite, it's a constant, finite doesn't depend on y. And it's the same in here, you will get the same number, okay? Then once we have, well, but we have to integrate along this whole line. So it's a, okay, but then you integrate in here, this is bounded by a numerical number. You integrate here, this is bounded by another numerical number, which doesn't depend on the height. And this thing here, well, you have a bunch of integrals here to do, and it's just bound by the maxima of the function, of this function here. If this function is analytic in here, it is bounded by the L2 integral by the, the soup of the function in this piece. Okay, so that, 
because we have a problem when this is zero. And uh, but, but since we're doing this, this thing here, uh, the function will be analytic close to zero, so you have a problem. So this, this is like a standard way of doing this kind of things. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, and then as in, in this, in other steps, uh, uh, one implies to, we, we have to use this thing again um, for the case P equals infinity. So the case one implies two is also basically a trick. So what we have, we have a function, which is entire LP on the line, and this type is less or equal than two pi B. Okay, so what we do, we first define, just define G epsilon of Z, there's no ciliary function. Let's see, is this guy. So we, we add an extra decay on the function. Okay. Um, do we have to separate? I, I think in here we don't even have to separate in cases. Uh, so my claim is that G epsilon now is L1 on the line and its type just increased by a little. Okay. And, uh, and why is that the case? Because, um, well, this guy is LP. So if I want to integrate this function, I could just apply Holdridge inequality. So P in this guy and P prime in this function. This function here is belongs to any LP. Okay, so therefore in L1. But also this function here will design as we saw before, this, this sign function here is exactly the type of the number you put in here, which is pi epsilon. So if you take the square, then you have two pi epsilon. So that's why we have this. Okay. And then, well, as, as we saw in the proof of the paper of unit theorem, whenever you have a function L1, um, which was even the assumption of the step two, oh, we can assume, assume the function is L1. And uh, the type of the function is the most something then it's full here transform is supported in a certain interval, okay? And in particular, we have Fourier inversion because the Fourier transform will be supported in a certain interval. Uh, oh, G, G is also LP, by the way, because this is less or equal than one, this function on the real line. So this is actually belonging to LP intersection L1, because this function here is less than equal to one on the real line. Um, so therefore, uh, but regardless of this, uh, uh, if you go to Bailey-Vin space, we also have Fourier inversion because if we hit transform, we'll be bounded a continuous function, if we hit transform of L1 function, we'll be bounded, but also supported in the interval, okay? So it's also L1. So when if we hit this form is also L1, then you have Fourier inversion. And then by Fourier inversion, you have uh, the reproducing kernel formula. And I did all that in the proof of the Pelevina uh, theorem. So bottom line, we get this formula. Okay. And then we can even take epsilon to zero because when epsilon goes to zero, this guy is converging in LP back to F and, and this guy is converging pointwise and it's bounded uh, uh, pointwise to a function. And um, if P is for instance, less than infinity, um, then we can apply for instance, uh, um, monotone convergence, uh, sorry, uh, the, the dominated convergence theorem to, to show that if I take epsilon to zero, then I even have a formula for F, which I don't want to use, but uh, you can even take, let me write this. To zero and will be 
a formula uh, for f. Okay, this is just a side remark. Well, in, in the step two implies one, we did that. We obtained the formula for f. So it would be natural to obtain the same formula in the step one implies two. But anyway, that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is a trick, okay? I want to show that this function belongs when I divide by the correct exponential, that f divided by this correct exponential belongs to the hp space. And then I do the same for f star later, which would be analogous. So how can we do that? And the trick is to use this g epsilon and to do the following. So let me do the LP norm of this function, okay? What I will do, since I know that G belongs to L1, I want to use that G is in L1 on the line and then just bound this by the soup of this guy. Why the soup? Because this will work nicely since this function is, has a certain decay. It grows exponentially, we know that. And then it's easy to show that this is less or equal than some constant Again, the same bound, I, Y. And let's say Y is positive now. V plus epsilon, sorry, Y. This is some constant C. Okay. But then we realize that, well, if what is the LP norm the actual LP norm that I want to measure is this one. LP next. Okay, but this function doesn't depend on X because the X part would be imaginary inside the exponential. So this guy here is just E to uh, two pi I Y. Well, X in B. Exact, exactly b plus epsilon. So if I put, I can move this epsilon, I can move this term here to the inside that integral and conclude that this is b plus epsilon. Oops. Z is less or equal than g epsilon one times a constant, okay? Because this is exactly the term that will show up in here. Okay, so great. And then I can, I can apply the same uh, procedure for G star than using the same, um, well, let me, let me just continue with it then and we can do for G star. Okay, so, so we concluded that, great. So what then? Well, but then this function here that implies that G epsilon, G epsilon, I should put X, plus I Y here. G epsilon Z divided by two minus two pi I B plus epsilon Z by definition belongs to the hard space because it's LP norm is bounded. Okay. But then if you know this, it's better because we know then that the LP norm, the supremum of those LP norm on this horizontal line is attained at the real axis. This is what we showed that actually when you do this, this LP norm on these uh, horizontal lines, they increase when you send Y to zero. That's what we saw before. So this thing, or equivalent, we can just do a, uh, we 
can just do a Jensen's inequality with a Poisson kernel since any function in the Hardy space has a Poisson kernel representation. And you have to differentiate in the, between the cases P equals infinity, et cetera, and make it work, et cetera. But anyway, this would be lasso equal than its norm on the real axis. LP next. This is a probability of hard spaces that we studied. But then this is this has norm one. This is uh, uh, this absolute value is equals one on the real line, and this guy is, was just what this was just f times something less or equal than one on the real line. Great. So I could just say that this. You can even write uh, it right here. But then we know that the soup in y positive is equal to the norm on the real line, but this is just less so you put in the LP norm of f on the real line. Okay. Great. Well, the hard space is uh, I can just take epsilon to zero then take epsilon to zero, and then we use Fatou's lemma for, this, for instance, to conclude uh, that the norm of f of x plus i y divided by minus two pi i b x plus i y l p in x, that's or equal than f lp on the line. So f of z divided by minus two pi i bz belongs to hp. And the half plane. And then you do the same for f star. And that will finish the result. Any questions in this this last step? So the, the nice thing here is just so the trick was uh, to, to just get a bound, just show that for some trick from some uh, slight modification of your original function, you end up with a function in HP. Uh, with the correct shape, which was a G defined by an explanation. Great. And then with some bound, it could be terrible. I don't care. Then you use the nice property of the, of, uh, the hardy spaces that you know where the maxima of these integrals is, and it has to be on the real line. And on the real line, your construction is uh, neat enough that you can get a uniform uh, bound that doesn't depend on epsilon. Okay, which was my construction here. And then, then it, everything fall, follows. So this is a kind of a, another kind of trick um, to like keep in your pocket within this, this, this theory. Okay, so we have now the paley Venus spaces with uh, P, which was nice and coming from this thing. So we still have like half an hour. And what I would like to do now is what? I would like to, to uh, comment about some applications of this Bailey Venus spaces in um, number theory. So I'll just start uh, briefly about uh, what's, what's called like extremal problems uh, in number theory when you want to prove certain sharp inequalities in analytic number theory. And then uh, the theory of, uh, of paley venus spaces will be very useful uh, to create some auxiliary functions that will, will help you to solve the problems. Um, so that's what I want to talk about now. And later on, I will do a full class about a paper, which is bound in the zeta function on the critical step, which has a very nice construction and simple 
construction using uh, uh, functions on the payload in the space, but, that, but that's for later. For later, we first need a, a let's say a, a initial introduction to 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 these sort of techniques. So let me do that now. And then maybe on the next, I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next class. Maybe I do another application or I start seeing the brain spaces. But I don't know. Okay, so, so there is a very important uh, application, uh, inequality number theory, which is called a Hubert inequality. So, so let me see. In analytic. So there is a very important uh, inequality uh, in number theory, which is called the Hubert inequality. Um, so, is uh, the Hubert inequality. Which is the following. So double sum, that is to make when n is different than n. And if you take the model if this, this is less or equal than pi, the sum of the squares, and it's sharp. That means you can't, as n goes to infinity, then um, the best constant you can put here is pi. Okay. And uh, one of the techniques to show uh, this inequality, well, you can do via uh, just linear algebra if you wish, and then always interested in this thing, I can give an, a reference, uh, but you can do it via maybe linear space techniques. And why, but before we started, let me say why, who initiated this sort of thing. So, uh, so, th so this inequality, so this inequality and the techniques We will see it today. Today, for instance, was uh, uh, was used uh, by uh, Selberg to prove the sharp form of the large sieve inequality. Okay, so the a sieve is a, a, a mechanism to um, count how many primes you have uh, that uh, are not inserted residue classes. Okay. Um, it's a very important tool in analytic number theory and uh, and Selberg was the first guy to realize that what well, we can use this Hubert inequality. And the techniques he invented to prove that, uh, um, to uh, improve and give the sharp form of the large sieve inequality. And, uh, and, and if you want to know more about this, I will give you a reference. Um, it's, it's a paper called Sum. Extremal functions. We analysis. Uh, this is a paper from 1985 of uh, Jeffrey Fowler. Is like 
the explains and the introduction explains several ways of using uh, this kind of stuff that I will talk today in other areas of uh, number theory. Uh, but I want to just start with, uh, instead of already going to the number theory aspect, I want to just keep it simple and just to explain how we can prove this inequality using uh, uh, techniques on paper genus basis. Okay. And uh, so I would try to do it in two ways. One way I will show and the second way I will give an estimate as a problem uh, set for, for next year. Um, okay, so how can we show this kind of thing? Um, okay, so what's, what's the idea here? Well, so what do we have? We have a, by a certain quadratic form. So let me define it Q. So, and this quadratic form is, as you can see, is skew symmetric, meaning it's adjoint, is associated with a matrix, which its adjoint is um, minus itself. Um, that means that basically this quantity here is always purely complex, okay? So for instance, if you start with the vector A, which is only real, this gives zero, okay? So it's common to divide it by pi, which pi is the guy which we show up here, so that'd be nice, and you divide by i. So now, it's, now you have a, a symmetric uh, 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 adjoint matrix associated with this quadratic form, okay? And then what I want to show in, you want to show to show that um, the largest eigenvalue of the matrix uh, if they are different. And if they are equal, you put zero. So it should be, um, see, one minus delta in M. If they are different, then this is just one. If they are equal, then you just put a zero, okay? Now to the largest eigenvalue uh, in moduli, That's, that's the statement that we want to show. That's Hubert's inequality. And what's the idea? And that's the idea that Selbert had uh, and also Berlin. So people, maybe I should mention the, the originate, uh, original people that thought about these problems and, and these kind of techniques for, um, so we should say here, the, you will say in the end, but the, the original people are writing in the end, but the, the original people was like the Berling, Selberg, uh, what else, Montgomery, that there was, he was the, the first guys to thought about uh, using this, what I will show now. So what, what was the idea? Uh, so the first thing you have to realize is that in the distributional sense, if you take the sine function so first, uh, note that if you take the sine function and you take its Fourier transform, so the sine function is the function that just gives the sine of the real value. The sine of x, if x positive is one, if x negative is uh, minus one. That function is just bounded. So you, you can't take the, its Fourier transform. But you can take it in a certain sense, in the distributional sense. 
if you take in this sense, you get a function and the function is exactly one over pi i c. Okay. So let me write it in the distribution sense. Okay. Which you don't have to bother what it is or not. If you know it, okay. If you don't know it, don't bother. Okay, in certain sense, you can make it, you can make this happen. Okay, so in a way you could write, you could write this term here as an integral because it's an integral of the sine function because you have this times a certain exponential, okay. And then maybe that would make things better. Okay, but I can't do it because well, this is only in a distributional sense. You see, I want to, in an in a exact sense, what you have to do is the following. So let me then define a certain approximation of the sine function, let's say sine lambda of t, which is e to minus lambda modulo i of t, the sine of t. So that would be this function here. This is one, it's minus one, and this can be decays here. And the decay is there. It's an odd function. Okay, now this guy, I can compute Fourier transform and etc. And it's an easy computation to compute this Fourier transform because it would basically in the end be just the Laplace transform of the sine function, if you do the calculation. And then these are easy. You can just use the Feynman method to differentiate both uh, times and etc. We can just do by other trick on you. If you compute this Fourier transform at the point C, uh, you can compute it and then you will get uh, four pi C divided by uh, be the square plus four square c squared. Uh, okay. That's what you get. This is, I'm not going to do the computation, but it's a simple computation. Then you realize that this converges to what? If lambda goes to zero, what's what we want, because we want to recover the, the Fourier transform in the distributional sense of the sine function. If lambda goes to zero, then you just get what? You just get one over pi C, you just get exactly one pi, one pi, one over pi I C, that's what you get. So great. So maybe I can define this quadratic form here instead, which would be some and then you put this guy here. So it would be four pi uh, n minus m divided by lambda squared is four pi squared c n minus m squared, and there is an i here. So then we see that one lambda, and lambda goes to zero. Okay, so maybe if I find the sharp bound for each one of these q lambdas, then I find the sharp bound for the qa in the limit, and that's what's going to happen. Okay, so now I know that I know that this is m different than m. Now I know something nice, and uh, I can write this as a Fourier transform. So let me write it. So q lambda a, and this is the the crucial bit, the crucial trick. This is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the function 
I wrote e minus one to the negative eight t sine of t e to minus two pi i t, and then it's evaluated at a point n minus m. So let me put n minus m here. T. Okay. And then we note that if n was equal to m, okay, this thing would be zero. So this thing would be zero. So this whole thing would be one. And then I would just integrating this function here. So this function is odd, so therefore it has mass zero. So I can even put n equals m now. I can just do that. Because when n equals m, it just gets zero. Okay, and now you realize that, well, this sum here, if I move this sum here to in max with this exponential here, we just have a square. This would be equal. So let me use my notation. This was uh, sine lambda of t, and this would be just a square. So very nice, it's the integral of a certain function but with times a positive term in this bit, okay? And now it comes the idea. So suppose, suppose you have two functions, lower and upper, in the pair of inner space one with type two pi. That means functions are one, it's Fourier transform, is supported in the interval uh, minus one, one, because B here is one. Great. And that L is less or equal than the sine lambda and is less or equal than the upper, okay? So it's a function that lies below this sine lambda and a function that lies above the sine lambda, okay? What do we get? Let's work with uh, the below, for instance. So since this is a positive thing, I could just down this from below by this. Then we get LT. I should probably put the lambda here. Okay. And then we get this sum. Now we can open this thing again. And you have a n a n bar. And then in here we will get as it was before, n minus n dt. But this thing is nothing but just if we hear it in form. of L lambda at the point N minus M, okay? But then it's, I think it's well, but the Fourier transform of F or L lambda is supported in the interval minus one, one. So if these are distinct integers, this thing is greater or equal than one in model Y. So this thing here is zero. So the only term here that's non-zero is when N equals M. So that function, so this, Auxiliary function L works as a filter and it filters the terms that you want. And even get just a multiplying constant in front because we could just if we hit this one at zero. And if we hit this one at the point zero is nothing but just, just the integral of X. And similarly, we get the Q lambda of A is less or equal than the integral of the upper function times the sum of the squares. So what we need to do now is clear
So we have to minimize, say, of maximize first. the integral of LOX and minimize the integral of u. So now you converted your problem into an optimization problem. You want to find the best constant, then you maximize or minimize the integral of, a, of functions assuming certain one-sided conditions. So for instance, for L, you are going to assume that L lambda is a function of S or equal to sine lambda, and it's a function of P that's in a space, and you want to maximize its integral. That, that way it would be cl as close as possible in the L1 norm to this target function sine lambda, and similarly with U. And this was the stuff I did in my thesis, okay? So this is what I did in my thesis. This is in my thesis. But that, th this wasn't the original approach to, um, to the Hubert inequality. Hubert show it and Hubert didn't do it that way. Uh, but uh, these techniques are very useful in, in, in number theory. And this is just one example. And then, then later on, that we will actually pick up a problem in number theorem and use this sort of op uh, optimization and procedure to produce some sharp inequalities in number theory. But so far, we've just seen the, how the procedure uh, works in a very simple case. And it turns out, oh, sorry, any questions so far? Okay, so it, it turns out that, um, uh, so what I showed was, yes, there is, so it turns out, uh, there is a unique L lambda and U lambda uh, minimizing which is what we want to do, the L1 distance That's what we want to do, we want to minimize the L1 distance to this function knowing that these guys are one-sided, that L lies below and U lies above and uh, and uh, one can clearly see that by the symmetry of the problem that we have to have because, well, I can even go to the graph. If I have something that lies below, above the sine function, then if you just flip it, this, the sine and reverse it, then you get something that lies in here, okay? Because the function is odd. So obviously the lower and the upper functions need to have the, those kind of symmetries. So you actually only need to build the lower one and the upper one would have to give the same uh, uh, value. Uh, and uh, the Fourier transform at lambda is one, is, uh, sorry, is minus one, which is equals minus the Fourier transform, at, which is the mass of these functions, is one. So then you conclude that Q lambda A, even better, I mean, it turns out it's even better than what we wanted. You get this for every lambda, and then you can send just send lambda to zero. Then send lambda to zero, you will be then. Uh, star. And star is what star is. This. Okay. And so, so that's the, these are the, the what's called extremal problems, uh, extremal functions in, in 
let's say number three, usually want to prove sort of inequality. Um, and then you come up with some clever construction that if you have a certain band limited function, then you can prove a certain bound and then you try to optimize the bound you have. And so the people that originated these techniques Machinery was Selberg, the famous Berlin, uh, the famous Montgomery, and etc. It was this was the original people that did that. But this, uh, 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 so that's a very nice way to prove this inequality, and, and the techniques can be used in many other places. Any questions so far? And I just want to finish, in, to finish by mentioning how can we create these functions? Like how can I create this L and this U? Okay. And it turns out, well, if this was an L2 kind of approximation, I could just use the channel with the curve formula and just treat this guy as a signal, although the, the name of the function even suggests. Um, I could just go back and use this formula here and just write and substitute in here just signal of lambda of n over 2b. And it, so you would get a function, and maybe that, that, that function is good enough. That function would interpolate the original one, but maybe it's one-sided already. Maybe it always, always lies above or always lies below. So if you do that, what will happen is that in this picture here, if we just interpolate using Shannon Whitaker, you get something like this, okay? You won't get something uh, uh, one-sided. It will be the best uh, L2 approximation as because that's, it comes out naturally to the function, but we want the best L1 and moreover, we want one-sided, we want something like below or above. But then you realize, well, okay, but then uh, if I, maybe I, can, I can't use interpolation, but maybe I can use some other sort of interpolation and it turns out, yeah, you can use some other sort of interpolation. And the interpolation you use, so the tool to uh, cook up, uh, let's say L and U lambda is interpolation with derivatives. And what we can show is that if F belongs the beta V of P, two pi, um, yes, beta V of P of two pi, and say P is greater than equal to one and not infinity. So this, this formula that we're right now even works uh, um, for every P. We just need it for p equals one, but anyway. Is a sum of fn, and then here you put just sine of i z minus n, by z minus n, and you take the whole thing squared, and then you put here the derivative, and just put sine by z n squared divided by I squared, and then here you just put z minus n not squared. Okay, and this this formula here prescribes the values of f at the integers and the derivative of f at the integers. Okay, so then what you can do is then you 
is a thing where you can just build a lambda by um, so u lambda uh, yeah yeah you, that may create u I think it has to be so just put the integers here and then the sign minus n minus n squared, then here put the derivative. Okay. And that's that's the way you create the function. Okay. And so that function will work and it will lie above and the L you just create by reflection, as I mentioned. Okay, and what you just need to do is uh, there's just one small detail nobody uh, that you have to realize, but this function here is always differentiable, but not at the origin. Okay, and and also so this thing is not well defined at the origin, and also the function value at the origin from the right is discontinuous the function. So from the right is one, and from the left is minus one. Yeah, so if you go back to the picture, if you want to build a measurement, which is usually what's called a measurement and a minorant. So if you want to build you the upper function, uh, the natural thing would be to interpolate that one, but then you have to guess what's the angle here. I mean, the shape should be something like this. It's the only way you can imagine something interpolating and flowing above. Uh, and flying above. Uh, so you have to guess what this angle is. It's, it's, it's not given by the problem. But you can guess it and then if, when you, that's the value you have to put here. And in the origin here, you have to put one. We once you do that, everything. And then the work, and then you have your function and then you just have to show that, yeah, this guy is enough. And if you think about interpolating with derivative is something like, uh, okay, because if I have something, you have a, like a polynomial I want to guarantee is positive, then uh, what you do is it either it flows, it flies above, but when it touches, it touches with the double root. So it guarantees that it bounces back. So that's why interpolation with derivative works, because if you have a function f, target function f, yeah, and you want to create something above, Okay, it's, it flies above and whenever it touches, it touches with the derivative agree. That means it, it bounces back. So, um, so, so that's why like heuristically it should work. Now we run out of time. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, so, so next class we will talk about a little bit more on these applications or maybe different spaces. Maybe we're talking about this application. Anyway, see you next Friday.